if you have a Bible, and I hope you or somebody around you does that you can look on with, let me invite you to open with me to James chapter, excuse me, James chapter one. Feel free to use table of contents if you need to. James chapter one, and as you're turning, I wanna welcome those of you in Prince William and Loudoun and Arlington and Moco, as well as others online who are physically unable to be with us today. It's good to come together around God's word. And here's the deal, last week we saw in James 1, 19 through 25, that if we just hear this word from God when we gather together and we don't do it, then we're deceiving or fooling ourselves. And I don't wanna be deceived or fooled and I'm assuming you don't either. So just to let you know where we're about to hear from God, he's about to tell us specifically to care for orphans and widows. So before we even hear what God is gonna say to us, we need to say yes to whatever he's saying to us. So we don't come to God's word thinking, let me hear what it says and then I'll decide whether or not I'm gonna do it. No, not not if you're a Christian. So a follower of Jesus has sacrificed the right to make the decisions in our lives. We do whatever God calls us to do because we trust God more than we trust ourselves. We're confident. He loves us. He knows what is best for us. So it's not like a big sacrifice to say to the God who made you, I'll do whatever you call me to do and the God who loves you and wants you to have life in that. Even if that leads us in ways we didn't see coming. So many of you have heard me tell the story about Heather and I being joyfully content with our four children at that time on a date night. And over dinner, we hadn't even planned on talking about adoption, but the subject of adoption came up and it was like God met us there at the table in a way neither of us saw coming before we knew it. Heather's crying, I'm like super self-conscious that the waiter and other people in the restaurant are thinking I'm the lamest husband, take my wife out and make her cry at the table. And uh, all that to say, by the time we walked out that night, we were ready to start the adoption process again the next morning and fast forward four years later, we have two more kids in our home and a story we never could have written. All that changed when God spoke to our hearts. So I just wanna invite all of us, before we hear the word of God to say, God, we wanna hear from you and we wanna do whatever you call us to do. And I'm not saying I know all the different ways he's gonna speak to us. I I do believe God is gonna call some of us in the next few minutes and in the days that flow from this day to foster or adopt a child into our family. I believe God is gonna call some of us to do a variety of other things to support children who don't have families. And I believe God is gonna call some of us to care for widows in ways we've never thought of before in our church family and in our city and beyond our city. So this is the wonder of meeting with God, which is what we're doing right now, hearing from God. You never know what's coming, but you know it will be good for us and for others and glorifying to him. So here's what I wanna do. I'm gonna put a prayer up here on the screen that I wanna lead us to pray together before we even read God's word today. So here's the prayer. God, I will do whatever you call me to do to care for orphans and widows. That's it. That's the prayer. And I want to invite every single follower of Jesus within the sound of my voice to pray this out loud with me. So you bow your heads with me. I'll start by just praying for us. And then I'm going to invite you just to repeat this prayer after me. So I'll start. Oh God, Father of the fatherless and protector of widows, this is who you are and we are asking you in this moment to speak to our hearts in all the places where we're gathered. And we are saying we wanna do whatever you call us to do, whether that's a small, simple step or a big, significant step. We wanna say, we don't wanna just hear your word and deceive ourselves, we wanna do it. So church, I invite you to repeat this prayer after me, phrase by 
phrase. Repeat after me. Say, God, I will do whatever you call me to do to care for orphans and widows. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So let's listen to the Spirit of God through the Word of God. Now, James 1, 26 and 27. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So God is telling us right now that there is a kind of religion that is worthless. It's empty, useless, even fraudulent. And there's a kind of religion that is pure, it's clean, it's holy. Matthew uses this same word to describe the clean linen shroud that wrapped Jesus' body after the cross. And undefiled, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26, uses this sort to describe how Jesus is unstained by sin. So in these two verses, God on high is telling us there's a kind of religion that he accepts and there's a kind of religion that he abhors. And it's really important to know the difference between the two. Because if we don't, then it's possible for us to create and practice a religion that works for us but is worthless to God. Did you hear that? It is possible for us to create and practice a religion that works for us but is worthless to God. So what kind of religion is pleasing to God? And I see three marks of pure and undefiled religion in these two verses. Knowing this list is not exhaustive, meaning there are many things in the Bible that God points to as pure religion. But this list is essential, meaning if you don't have these qualities in your religion, then you don't have religion that honors God. So you might write these three down. This is really important to know. Mark number one of pure and undefiled religion is controlled speech that demonstrates a changed heart. Controlled speech that demonstrates a changed heart. Let me give you a heads up. We're gonna hit this first mark briefly today because this specific theme is gonna come up again in depth in James chapter three, most of that chapter. But for now, if anyone thinks he is religious, and does not bridle his tongue. So notice it's not about muzzling the tongue, but controlling the words we say, not deceiving his heart. You see the relationship here between the tongue and the heart? James is recounting what Jesus said multiple times. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. What we say is a reflection of what is inside of us in such a way that if our speech is not controlled, the Bible says your religion at the core of your heart is worthless. The way you speak to your spouse, to your parents, to your kids, to your friends, coworkers, classmates, not just out loud, but through text, through email, through any way we use our words, the way we speak to other people and about other people, including the way we speak to or about people we don't like or who may be our enemies. All of these are indicators of what's in your heart. If you engage in gossip or slander, if your words are biting, if they are angry, if you engage in cursing or coarse joking, if your words are foolish or simply inundated with trivialities, 
they are reflecting something deeper within you. God help us to control our tongues, particularly in a culture that says, if you have a thought, you should immediately speak it, share it, text it with someone else or with the rest of the world. Don't do it, brothers and sisters. Bridle your tongue. Speak in a way that reflects a heart that loves God above all and loves others as yourself. This is the first mark of pure, undefiled religion, controlled speech that demonstrates a changed heart. Can we just pray that right now? God, help us to control our speech in a way that reflects the heart of Christ living in us. And then, so thinking about the heart leads us right into this next mark of religion that God accepts. Number two, sacrificial care for the vulnerable in the world specifically for this pair, orphans and widows. A pair that we see throughout Scripture, and it oftentimes also includes sojourners. So let's go on a quick tour in the Bible. You won't have time to turn to all these places. Maybe write down some of the many places where we see God's concern and commands to care for this vulnerable pair specifically, orphans and widows. From the very introduction of God's law in Exodus chapter 22, verse 22. So right after the Ten Commandments, we read, You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. Deuteronomy 10, 17 and 18. The Lord your God is God of gods, Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God. Just picture his greatness. And then how does God display his greatness? He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow. He loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Psalm 68, verse 5, father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God. This is who he is in his holy habitation. He commands his people. As a result, Isaiah 1, 17, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Jeremiah 22, verse 3, thus says the Lord, do justice and righteousness, deliver from the hand of the oppressor him who has been robbed, and do no wrong to vi or violence to the resident alien, the fatherless, and the widow. Hear God saying, don't sit around debating justice, do it. Don't sit around debating oppression. Deliver the oppressed and care for the resident alien, the fatherless, and the widow. So it's no surprise then to come to James chapter 1, verse 27, and see this pair again in God's word. Now this verse uses a fascinating word to describe what pure and undefiled religion does with the orphan and the widow. It visits them. So what does that mean? What's God telling us to do? Go say hello to them, spend a little time with an orphan or a widow, then move on with our lives? Or is there more to it than this? Well, this word for visit here is used 11 times in the New Testament and a few more times in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and it sure seems like it's more than just making a short visit. So let's take one more tour of the Bible. Look where we see this word, starting in Genesis chapter 50, verse 24. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land, the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. This is saying God is gonna come to you amidst your slavery in Egypt, and he's gonna bring you up out of slavery, and he's gonna bring you to the promised land that he's made for you. That's what it means to visit you. Come and bring you into a whole new place. Psalm 8, verse 4. What's man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? The word for care for here is the same word that's translated visit in Genesis 50, 24. God visits us by caring for us. Psalm 106, verse 4. Remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people. Help me when you save them. The word for help here is the same word that we see translated visit in Genesis 50, 24. Showing how God visits us by helping us and showing favor to us. So it's no surprise when you get to the New Testament and you read Luke 1, 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. That's not saying God made a short visit to his people. He came to them to redeem them. Just 10 verses later, look at this imagery. 
because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. God in his tender mercy visits us like the sun shining on us, bringing light to darkness and the shadow of death, guiding our feet to peace. That's what it means to visit. Luke 7, after Jesus raises a widow's son from the dead, the Bible says, fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, a great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. How about that? Jesus is God's definition of visitation. And not just Jesus. Look at this description of Moses in Acts 7, verse 23. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. Moses goes to the people of Israel, seeks them out to take responsibility for their deliverance, for their well-being, for their future destiny. One more, the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, James speaks up and says, Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take them from, from, from them a people for his name. God has visited the nations, not just to say hello, but to save them and call them to be his people. Is this not an amazing word, visit? We haven't even mentioned when this same word is used in Matthew chapter 25 to, so I'll just write that one up here, Matthew 25, when uh, Jesus says when you visit the vulnerable, the sick, the hungry, the imprisoned, you visit me. So are we hearing what God is saying to us right now? This is religion that is acceptable before God. It's not paying token attention to the vulnerable. It's visiting them in the same way God has visited you. It's going to them, caring for them, taking responsibility for their well-being, raising them up, bringing them out, giving them life. The implications of this word are staggering. God is saying to us, particularly in a culture and a country where millions of babies are vulnerable in their mother's wombs, millions of children are vulnerable out of the womb in need of moms and dads, who have what they need to care for them. And not just those children, but vulnerable birth moms and dads and families who for a variety of reasons are not able to care for a particular child who need the support of others and widows. And I should add, while this passage is clearly talking about widows who are alone due to the death of a spouse and they need support in caring for them, there are also many Functional widows who are alone because of divorce and need this kind of support. God's undoubtedly calling us as a church to come alongside them and their affliction as well. Pure and undefiled religion takes responsibility to care for the vulnerable from the womb to the tomb. Amen. So I think about Randy and Courtney, friends of Heather and mine who used to live down the street from, who spent the first 30 plus years of their life in cultural Christianity, involved in church, cultural Christianity, but not pure and undefiled religion, until one day God visited them and opened their eyes to his love for them, opened their hearts to new life in him that went beyond the routine of religion. They were born again. Amen. And with their new birth came a new heart for the vulnerable, particularly widows. Randy's an electrician by trade. Courtney's a nurse practitioner. So they started looking for opportunities to visit widows in their affliction. And long story short, they started a ministry on the side where they now spend their weekends and many days during the week doing fairly unglamorous work in widows' homes, rewiring electricity, fixing plumbing, building wheelchair ramps, cleaning bathrooms, changing diapers, delivering medicine, visiting and staying with many of these widows until their last breath. I've heard from some of the people that Randy and Courtney have visited. These are the kinds of things they say. One widow said, Randy and Courtney are my friends. They're my family. I believe that God sent them to me to encourage me and to help me. 
Sometimes I ask God if they're even real. It's like God has sent me some angels to take care of me. They pray with me, they help me with my house, they always come and check on me. They bring me food and groceries, they read the Bible with me. I know that they care. Sometimes I just feel like I wanna cry because I am so thankful to God for sending them. Another said, when I see Jesus, I'm gonna tell him everything Randy and Courtney did to help me and serve me and take care of me. One more said, I spent over 20 years without a friend. Then Randy and Courtney became my friends. They've given their life to show mercy to people like me. And to me, that is the very picture of who Jesus is. The woman who said those words was elderly and disabled and went to be with the Lord not long ago and she died holding her friend Courtney's hand. That's what it means to visit. It means sacrificial care for the vulnerable in the world, in their affliction. A word that can include everything from oppression to tribulation. Let's not forget that the reason orphans and widows exist in the world is because sin and suffering and trauma and tribulation and death exist in the world. Babies are aborted, children are orphaned, widows are alone because this is a fallen world. And God says in the middle of it, pure religion steps into the fallenness. Doesn't take the easy route around it. Steps into the fallenness and takes responsibility for the well-being of the vulnerable. And in this way, sacrificial care for the vulnerable in the world is not an option for Christians. It is an obligation for Christians. It is a gloriously grace-driven obligation for followers of Jesus Christ. And, so that's the word here, and does this such, in such a way that we keep ourselves unstained by the world. So here's the third and final mark of true religion. In this verse, true religion is telling us involves clear separation from the ways of this world. Keeping oneself unstained from the world. Now, when we hear that word unstained, we probably think, okay, like moral purity. Sounds good, be morally pure. And then we turn the page on James 1 and get ready for James 2. But remember, the chapter divisions are not from us, or are from us, not from James. Which means that what follows in chapter 2, verse 1, which we're gonna look at more next week, flows from chapter 1, verse 27. So let's just think for a minute about how these verses relate to each other. Because James, James closes this verse with the word world. He uses that word three other times in the book. It always refers to a fallen world system that goes against the ways of God. And true religion, God says here in James 1.27, does not live according to this fallen world system. And we talked about this last week, how we're so often just like this world, filling our minds, hours, every day with what this world offers us instead of God's word in ways that keep us from God's ways. Now, specifically here in chapter two, James immediately, right after he writes this verse, starts talking about favoritism in the world toward the rich, because that's how the world works. The world loves to honor the rich and neglect the poor. And the problem James is addressing is it wasn't just the world. The church was stained by the world in this way. Look, look at chapter two, verse one. Again, we'll talk about it more next week, but James 2, 1 says, my brother, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For from man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes in your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in. Do you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? Do you hear what the Holy Spirit is saying through James here? According to the world, you go out of your way to honor and respect and treat well the person who can benefit you the most. 
Can I say that one more time? According to the world, you go out of your way to honor, respect, and treat well the person who can benefit you the most. But that is not true religion, James says. True religion, so now make the connection with sacrificial care for orphans and widows, visiting them in their affliction. You go out of your way to honor and respect and treat well those who this world would say will benefit you the least. Are you seeing this? Are you seeing how true religion goes totally against the ways of this world? Think about it, control your tongue? No, speak your mind. Let your words fly from your mouth and in every form of media available to you. And adopt, foster children? No, do you realize what that would cost you? How that would change the plans you have for your life and your family? Look at what it will take away from your other kids. You're too busy anyway. How could you add that to your plate? Get a dog instead of a kid. It's real advice Heather and I were given in this world over the last couple of years. Why step into hard and difficult and unpredictable situations? Just take care of your own. And widows, somebody else will take care of them. Some other person or organization or institution. You have so many things you wanna do with your life. So many things you wanna accomplish. Don't, don't let them hold you back. Do you see how true religion requires a radically different perspective of this world and the purpose of your life in it? How true religion requires a radically different perspective of orphans and widows and your relationship to them. And let me be crystal clear at this point. We don't do this because we're some group of good altruistic people out to be saviors and rescuers for orphans and widows in this world. That is not who we are and that is not why we do this. We don't care for orphans and widows because we're rescuers. We care for orphans and widows because we're the rescued. It's the whole point of what we're seeing. It's the whole point of the gospel. If those of you who maybe are exploring Christianity, visiting with us, what unites us together is the fact that God on high has visited us in our ultimate vulnerability. God has come to us in our ultimate need, our sin against him that deserves eternal judgment. And God has come to us to forgive us from our sin through sending his son as a sacrifice to die on a cross for our sin. He's risen from the dead. He's ascended on high so that anyone who believes in him and his love for us will be forgiven of all your sin and restored to relationship with God. This is what drives everything we do. It's who our God is. It's what God has done in our lives. If he's not done it in your life, we invite you today, trust in him and realize at that point, you're not a rescuer, you're the rescued. And on a related note, I, I also wanna say to every child or every adult who has been an orphan without a family in your life, maybe you've been a part of the foster care system or maybe you've been adopted. I want you to know on behalf of our entire church family that we honor you. We honor you for so many reasons. First and foremost, for how you are made in the image of God. And we honor you for all you have faced and all you continually face in your unique life story, including unique challenges that you endure. We honor you and we love you in a way that we hope you see far more important, God on high honors and loves you. And, and I also wanna say to every birth mom or birth dad who for any number of reasons has not been able to care for your child, you've taken steps to make sure your child is cared for or you're working to be able to care for your child. We as a church want you to know we honor and love you that we are for you. We wanna support you in every way we can because well, God sees you, God sees all that you're walking through and he honors and it's for you. 
And finally, I want to say to widows in our midst, we honor and cherish you. We praise God for his strength in your faith, in your courage, in your endurance, and the unique beauty of your trust in him in the middle of hard days and hard months and hard years. Which leads to a few people I want to introduce you to because I want you to see the beauty of faith here. That's why we're calling this journey through James the beauty of faith. I want to show you the beauty of true religion. So these three members of our church family are going to join me out here. And I want to start, kind of set up uh, this time by giving a shout out specifically to Moco. So I want to read a letter from the, the, our Moco location received from a social worker in the Montgomery County Department of Health and Human Services. So this letter said, we want to thank all of you, McLean Bible Church, Montgomery County staff and location, and entire church for all the support, encouragement, gifts, and resources that you have provided to our staff, families, and the children in our community. It goes on to talk about the number of foster children who've been cared for by MoCo families, how some of these children have been reunited with their birth families, which is the hope and goal. Four of those children were not able to be reunited with their families and have found forever families in NBC homes. They said the impact that NBC and the families in your community have had is truly amazing. Thank you again for everything the church has done and is doing to support our staff and the vulnerable children and families in Montgomery County. Praise God for the beauty of faith in MoCo. And the way this is playing out in different locations, but I, I wanna uh, introduce you to two of the members of the MoCo family, uh, Jim and Dee Dee Schumacher, who were named by the state of Maryland as foster parents of the year recently. And you're, you're gonna hear from them just about, they, one, none of these three wanna be up here, uh, just to kinda get that out on the table. Uh, not that they don't love what we're talking about, it's they love doing what we're talking about instead of getting on a stage and talking about it. So I'm thankful for their willingness to uh, uh, step out of the comfort zone and, and do this. But let me, let me read you. And, and, and I know they want it to be clear that this is God's grace in them at work. But I, I want you to hear a celebration of God's grace. This is the, this is the letter that was written to nominate them for uh, foster uh, parent or resource parent of the year. Didi and Jim Schumacher uh, epitomize the theme of uplifting families. The Schumachers were licensed as resource parents in December 2019. Prior to becoming resource parents, they were involved in supporting the foster care and adoption ministry at their church, NBC, supporting the department through this ministry, hosting resource home recruiting events, the back to school jam school supplies and party for foster children, kinship and in-home service families leading the holiday gift drive and gift wrapping event, supporting social work staff with thank you notes, gift certificates, and other treats, to name just a few of the many ways. They've worked behind the scenes in service and support of all of our resource families, staff, transitioning youth, kinship, and in-home services families. Through the Woven Ministry at NBC, Dee Dee has helped to lead a support group for foster and adoptive parents. If a transitioning youth, a birth family, or anyone needs something, the first call is to Dee Dee, who has facilitated getting furniture, supplies, groceries, clothes, and whatever else might be necessary to support a child, teen, or family. Becoming a resource family is truly an endeavor, not only for Dee Dee and Jim, but for their three older sons, Ryan, Zach, and Luke, who have been involved in all aspects of this adventure, from helping with the events and activities, and in the love, care, and sacrifices that are part of being a resource family. Shortly after becoming licensed, the Schumachers accepted placement of twin five-month-old boys who had been born several weeks premature and both had serious brain injuries and developmental delays. Dee Dee and Jim have done a phenomenal job meeting these boys' needs, managing all the medical and intervention appointments and advocating for them to receive the services, supports, care, and intervention that was needed. And in November 2022, the Schumachers adopted these twins. I think we've got a picture of the family to put on the screen. So praise God for his grace. So I, I, I mean, this is what others are saying about you. I'd love to hear this journey from your perspectives. Like how did it start in your own heart and what have you learned in this process? Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Well, just first to start, I think um, McLean has been a big help in everything. Um, you know, so many of you are to thank for this, for your financial support, your sacrificial support and volunteering. Um, it does take a team, and so uh, we are so appreciative of all you do give. Um, we have a very giving family here, so I love that. Mm. Um, but we did want to clarify, and David alluded to it, but I just want to make sure it's clear is that, um, you know, when um, it's really, it's not us who deserves any praise at all. Like, it's, it's really not. We um, stepped into this not knowing, we knew nothing about foster care. We really didn't feel like we had anything. We didn't have much to bring to the table, right? But... Um, God called us to it, right? He called us um, not in spite of that we didn't have what we needed, but because of that. Because he wanted us to step out in faith, take that step to trust him and trust what he was calling us to. Um, and for our story, it was a lot of steps. We're only going to highlight a few, but, um, and they're the big ones. So I don't, but there are a lot of steps of trusting him and hard situations where we didn't see it, but yet he called us to, you know, um, walk in the way he, he was calling us to. So there's a lot of small things too, but, um, we, um, you know, when we did step out in faith and we said, yes, he showed up in mighty ways and he worked in only ways that he could work, right? He worked through us. We made ourselves available and he, you know, he changed hearts. He changed our heart. He has deepened our love for this, you know, for these, the, these families and these children and has put a passion in our heart for that. Um, he has, you know, just, in, we've, he's walked us where we are. Faith has increased so much. I can't mm. even, even explain. So um, there's so many ways. He's opened doors that couldn't have been opened otherwise. Um, and um, it has been a, you know, it's been a hard, it's a hard journey, but um, one that has been amazing. We've been so blessed by it, even by the pictures gone now, but those two little people up there are just like, yeah, we couldn't have imagined them either so many years mm. ago, and they are just such a joy. So, But it is really God who deserves all praise, all glory. Um, so we just want you to listen to our story from that perspective is that he called us, we stepped out, and he showed up and did the work through us, mm. right? So it just take that step of obedience. But um so our journey started about five years ago um, when God gave an opportunity to meet or work along, volunteer alongside some other um, members at our church at MoCo and really just develop relationships with child welfare and see how we could come along, how we could support them, how we could encourage them. And one of the things was, of course, the need is always recruit foster parents, right? There's always a need for that. So we began raising awareness and encouraging people to pray about that. And as we did that... Um, we really felt God, you know, he spoke to me and just said, okay, dear, this is great what you're doing. You know, you step out and you're doing this, but why aren't you praying that for your family? And I was like, I don't really know, right? I don't have an answer. It doesn't seem like that. I don't know. Why. But I, um, I did pray and then, you know, and I got on board pretty quickly with that, you know, to uh, step into it. And so, um, you know, I took it home to Jim. And um, so Jim, how quick did you come around? Uh, not so quick. Uh, so, I think if we go back to that time, I was uh, 56 years old, contemplating retirement in the next few years, and my vision, my vision, was not uh, to be a foster parent as I head into retirement and uh, take on that challenge. Uh, obviously, my vision is not important uh, in, in the total <laughs> scheme of things. But, um, you, know, you know, I mean, I really thought from my perspective, uh, you know, I said yes to helping support what Dee Dee was doing with the foster system and bringing organization to backpack drives and everything. And so, to me, I was like, okay, I said yes. And but you know, we we talked, we prayed, we went through it as a family pretty hard for the next three months or so. And as David said, in in July of 2019, we decided to take the second yes and said yes, we will become foster parents. And went through the classes and everything it took to December and we get to December and we get licensed to be foster parents at that point in time. And it's important to understand, like, at least from my side, the, we, we were clearly listed as not to adopt. And, and that's okay. I mean, there's plenty of foster parents who are not to adopt. You know, you're just there to help along the way in the journey and the overall goal of 
of foster care is, is reunification with their biological parents. And so um, we, we, we stepped into that way. We get to January, and the uh, first couple weekends of January, we get respite care. So we have uh, a different child for each of the first two weekends um, in January. And I'm like, oh, this is pretty good. I can handle this. We got just uh, weekend duty, and uh, then we keep going on. And so uh, not too bad, I thought. Uh, but then at the end of the at the end of the month, they called and said, asked Didi, you know, would you guys be willing to take uh, five-month-old twins with significant medical issues and uh, born three months premature? Uh, can you take that on? And I, I, I heard the medical, but I really heard the twins aspect. I was like, well, it's, uh, but um, you know. Got on board pretty quick. At the end of the day, we were willing to do it. And, uh, and they came in, and, and from day one, they, they were family to us. Uh, you saw our older boys, they embraced them as their brothers. And as long as they were going to be in our care and it was God's will they're going to be with us, we were going to care for them as family. And, uh, you know, and, and COVID hit, you know, things locked down. We, you know, we, you know, we were close, obviously, in that period of time. Um, but we did, we, we developed a, I'd say, more of a correspondent relationship with their biological parents, uh, uh, keeping them updated on what was happening in their lives, the medical needs, how they're progressing, and that kind of thing. And, you know, a level of trust uh, was developed from how we informed them, I believe. And that was uh, just working through that. And you, you go forward now all the way to um, September of 2000. 21, uh, 22, excuse, uh, no, 21, sorry, 2021, um, in a court update, the, the biological parents uh, preemptively came into the room and said they were, are willing to forego their rights as long as the Schumacher family are willing to adopt them in an, in an open adoption, meaning we will have an ongoing relationship with them. And um, frankly, you know, now we're at the third yes, uh, that, it was the easiest yes. I mean, they, they, the kids have been with us. It was like, if they were going to go back, that was God's will if they were going back. But if they weren't going back to their biological parents, there was no other place for them in our minds. So um, we, we went through it, and it was still a long process. But uh, by November, as David said, November 22, we uh, formalized the adoption. So the... Um, <laughs> I, I would say that the journey is a long journey, um, you know, tough parts along the way, but overall, I mean, just phenomenally for our family, and uh, God worked great with us, gave us a support system, was unbelievable, from friends um, who supported us, um, with social workers who were awesome to us, and, and medical specialists, a lot of medical specialists who really came alongside, and teachers as they moved along here. Um, you know, doing what I would consider above and beyond in, in really embracing, loving the kids. And, um, you know, Yanni and Kenny are doing great today. And uh, we've got a long way to go. We keep working with them, but um, it's, it's, it's awesome. I hope, yeah. I hope you hear, I mean, there's so much I hope you take away, but you heard words like hard and tough and wonderful and phenomenal. There's a beauty of how those go together. And this, there's, there's nobody in the picture, in the story you just heard, for, that there's not hard and tough for children, for birth parents, for foster and adoptive parents. There's hard and tough and all that. And there's phenomenal and there's beauty and there's wonderful and there's faith growing. I, I think we, yeah, we're concerned when we step out sometimes that this is not gonna be good for us. We can trust our God. Amen. That it's not just good for others, it's good for us in ways we didn't even realize we needed. So how would you encourage, uh, Dee, Dee, just anybody who's thinking maybe the Lord's leading me to foster or adopt? Yeah, so I would just tell you to take a step, right? Take a step. Um, into that to learn more. I think sometimes when we look at the overall picture, you start, you know, your mind can get filled with so many things. And just like us, we had a lot of worries. We had a lot of limitations and concerns, but you just have to take that step of faith. Um, and, and 
you know, don't wait until life is less busy, right? I think sometimes we think, oh, when, when this happens, it'll be okay. Um, I do that a lot at home. I never say, oh, it's never less busy, right? So don't use that as an excuse, mm-hmm. I would say, because I think that's what it is. It's never going to be a great time, but I can tell you it's so worth it to step in in any way, um, not just foster care um, as foster parents, but um, I think A great first step is the class that you're offering starting next week as information session for foster and adoption. Tyson's does an amazing job of walking you through it biblically. And it's just such a great, just to help process and talk and learn from others. I just highly encourage that if God is putting it on your heart, right? Just even, you don't have to, like, you don't have to make a decision, right? You just go and attend and learn. Um, But God is not calling all of us here to foster, um, but he is calling each and every one of us to do something, right, Um, to step out in some way. And there are so many ways you can serve. Um, I know some of the partners that we work with are in the um, lobby that I highly encourage you to speak to them. Um, But, you know, just a few ways. One way is um, uh, there's this I cannot say this word. I got messed up on the first statistic. <laughs> I have a hard time with that. But there's a statistic that says um, uh, 50% of, fo- of foster families will quit within one year. And it's because of a lack of support. So what an amazing way to come alongside a family who's already in the, in the trenches and just supporting them and praying for them. And the beauty, I think, of the whole thing is if the situation allows to also be able to support the biological family because the church is in a unique position and we have a focus on that family unit that we bring to foster care, right? And it's, so it's our, it is our goal to reunify these and just um, give the support that these families need. That's really um, a huge way to serve. But there's, there's a lot of others, and I know you're going to mention them later, but just really step out in faith, trusting God if he's called you to it. He already knows. He knows the story, and he is a good God. Trust he's a good God, a loving God, a caring God, a God who is always near. I think that's one thing I've learned so much through this is he is so near. And when you put yourself out there in these positions, that's when you really, really start to see it. Hmm. Dee Dee mentioned uh, uh, so much there. That foster, adoption foster care class is available online, so for any locations, and it starts this week, this Tuesday, uh, and so you can find that information on our website or talk to location pastors about that. Um, yeah, so many opportunities, and I just, I've just prayed that from this day even particularly, there would be fruit in lives and families. Like church, we're made for this. We're made for this in a way no other body in the world is made for this. We praise God for partnerships with organizations and partnerships with uh, even those who are working in government agencies along these lines. We are so thankful for all those who are working to care for children in these ways. Church, we are made for this if we'll step into it. And then the other side of James 1.27, I want to introduce you to Karen Hilliard. And uh, yeah, uh, without telling your story, why don't you share your story with us, Karen? And again, thanks for your willingness to to do that. Thank you so much. Um, I met and married um, my husband in Jacksonville, Florida, many, many years ago, and he was a Navy pilot. And after we had a a kind of a whirlwind uh, courtship, he was a Christ follower. But after we got married, we had to figure out how are we gonna build this life together? Because anybody that's in here that's ever been in the military, you know how it's a challenging way of life. But anyhow, uh, deployments were common. He was always on an aircraft carrier somewhere and for long periods of time. So I ended up trying to see if I could work out schedules with my work where I could take time off and go over and meet the aircraft carrier when they were in port, when it was possible. So. Um, that was a big deal for us to at least try to be able to be, we didn't even have phones in some of those times way back in the 80s. It was like they would be in the Indian Ocean for 90 days and there weren't even any ports anywhere. So snail mail was, was it. So anyhow, um, deployments were a normal way of life, but so were the, the homecomings. We always had big celebrations. And one in particular that I remember was back like during Operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm, and perhaps you remember it as well. Um, they had all the yellow ribbons on the trees, and there were big parades, and 
they, it was really a hero's welcome. So we always tried to make my husband feel special whenever he came home, whether it was a big deal like that or just a regular one. But um, uh, after, well, five years later, 1991 is what I was talking about with the big celebration. Well, five years later, he goes back over to the Persian Gulf. And this time, um, his squadron is doing some exercises with Navy SEALs, and it just went horribly wrong. There were 12 people that were on that aircraft, and it crashed into the Persian Gulf. So um, the good side was that nine people survived the crash. Two bodies were recovered, and one person was missing. And the one that was missing was my husband, Jeff. So I was told that I needed to go home and I needed to pray because there was the possibility that, you know, Jeff would be found alive. And, of course, I was full of hope because my husband was... Uh, a triathlete. He was always entering triathlons and um, very fit. And he was a competitive swimmer in school. So I just knew that that was going to be a big story whenever they found him. Well, they did find him a week later. And I got the knock on the door. And they told me that they had recovered his body. And so my husband was coming home. But this time he was coming home in a flag draped coffin. And there wasn't going to be any parade or any um, yellow ribbons or anything like that. Instead, I had to plan a funeral, and I was 38 years old. Um, my story is that I had been a Christ follower for 23 years before that because I you know, um, gave my life to Christ when I was 15 years old. So I at least had that going for me, and I just leaned into God because I lost a lot of my normal connections, because once you're out of the military, you know, everybody tries to get you to the funeral, and once you're past the funeral, you're kind of on your own. And that's really more of a cultural thing and not a military thing at all. I think people really believe that if you could just help someone get to the funeral, then people start dropping off. And I'm, I'm sure there are people in this room that can tell me they've had that story too. But God was really good. You know, I was wondering, you know, what, what am I gonna do now? I mean. Um, providing, you know, paying for my bills and things like that. So he was good. He made a way. He uh, took me out of Florida. I'd lived there for 32 years, and I ended up going to Atlanta first for a couple of years. And then I moved here in 2001, and I still believe that that was God-ordained because I had been volunteering for mentoring other military widows with the Tragedy Assistance, Assistance Program for Survivors. And when the plane hit the Pentagon and all of those people were tragically lost, I was able to volunteer um, after work and on weekends to people that really needed someone to listen to what they were going through. Because it's very disruptive to have someone in your life one day and then just gone the next. So um, people make a difference. Church makes a difference. I had uh, a family that supported me. I came to McLean Bible Church in 2001, and I've been here ever since. I've, I've loved this church and all that it means to me. It's just been uh, a wonderful experience. But um, getting to volunteer with Grief Share and other things like that, it's fabulous. Okay, so she just throws that out at the end, getting to volunteer with Grief Share. I just want you to know God's grace in Karen. I mean, she's received comfort from God, and she has poured it out. She is up here all the time with Grief Share, walking with all kinds of people through grief in different circumstances. And, uh, and that's just one of the many ways she's serving behind the scenes as the overflow of God's faithfulness in her life. So how would you encourage us as a church family when it comes to, and you've already mentioned some things, when it comes to caring specifically for widows? So I'm thrilled that our church does have some ministries that are really wonderful, like Stephen Ministry and Grief Share. Those are just wonderful ministries. If, if you know someone who is um, grieving the loss of a loved one or is struggling and is having difficulty, I truly recommend both of those. Um, but I'm not going to let the rest of you off because everybody in here has a part to play. Mm -hmm. And really, it's just knowing um, about other people's lives and pouring into them, I just realize that it takes time. You know, our society makes it sound like if you can just get to the funeral, it's fine. Well, most people who are grieving, they may be um, needing more emotional support or other types of support for many, many months, way past the funeral. So if you can do practical things, even simple things like spending time with people, that might only be an investment of your time, but if you've got special gifts, as David was mentioning in his message about who, the friends that he has, 
Um, even cutting grass or picking up someone's kids from soccer practice or something like that. There's so many things that everyone can do and it's, it basically, basically comes down to just loving one another as Jesus told us to do and that's what I would encourage everybody here. If you do know people that are grieving the loss of a loved one or their widows, that you would come alongside and just um, let them know that you see them, that you love them, and that you care for them. Mm. Karen, uh, I can't wait to meet Jeff, and I look forward to the day when we get to meet Jeff uh, personally, all who are in Christ. And uh, we praise God for his grace in you and Jim and Didi. The beauty of faith, the beauty of faith by God's grace. And I just, I praise God for the overflow of his grace in them in ways that are serving so many different people, specifically orphans and widows. So will you praise God with me for his grace in them? Thank you guys, thank you. So what is God leading you to do? This is, this is that moment where I wanna just give you an opportunity to come before God. I, I hope, I trust, he's been speaking all throughout this time. But I wanna give you a moment, just block everything else out and just listen. And there's so many ways God might be leading you to care for orphans and or widows. There's no shortage of need, and there's no shortage of opportunity in our church family, in our city, and around the world. So I wanna invite you just right now, you to bow your heads, or if you wanna write some things down, to spend some time before the Lord. God, what do you want me to do? What do you, and even just first step, you don't have to decide everything right now, but what's some first steps you can take to learn more even about possible things he might be leading you to do. I just, between you and the Lord, spend a couple moments in prayer and then I or other location pastors will take things from there. But let me just start us. God, we, we've heard your word clearly today. Please lead us, even now, by your spirit, where we are caring for orphans and widows, we pray that we would feel the affirmation of your spirit. You, we would just know in a fresh way you're with us and for us and would give us what we need. Where there are ways you're calling us to do this now and in the days ahead and more ways or different ways, we pray that you would lead us. Help us to hear and obey. Spend some time between you and the Lord right now. <laughs> 